some of the latest thinking around how we organize and how we structure our work. I think as we've seen in the past, frameworks like ITIL, intentionally or not, they can have a profound impact on how we, how we structure roles, how we organize our work, how we think about professional development, and how we plot out career progression. Um, Verism is a recently launched approach to service management. It's been developed by an international panel of industry leaders, and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome the um, chief architect, Claire Agata, to tell us a bit more about it. Thank you very much, everyone. It's, um, it's lovely to be here. This is my first time at this conference. I would prefer to follow someone who was a bit more rubbish, but you know, <laughs> what can you do? I will have to do my best to try and um, to try and live up to that standard. So what I'm going to talk about today is Verism, which is a service management approach for the digital age. And really, it's more about some thinking that we've been doing about how we need to change as individuals in IT, about how technology is changing and about how we work, you know, that's changing as well. So I'm going to share a little bit about the project and share a little bit more about how Verism actually works because things have advanced significantly in the year that um, I've been working on this project. So Verism, it's all about the digital age and Digital transformation was kind of where we started, and I'm going to ask you to be a tiny bit interactive, but not, not massively, so don't be too worried. I would just like you to put your hand up if you have heard this term, digital transformation. Wow, that's pretty much everyone in the room. And then put your hand up if your organisation has some kind of project, program, working group that's looking at the impact of digital transformation. Okay, so I think more than half the room. And put your hand up if you can confidently tell me what digital transformation <laughs> is. <laughs> so, this is one of those amazing buzz phrases that people are using to try and sell you everything from a smart fridge to a new piece of software to new printers. But digital transformation is important. And I think the fact that so many of your organizations are looking at it just shows its significance. And really, the definition is quite simple. It is just about how technology is affecting every single thing that we do now. The IT department is strategic. You are all strategic assets. You are essential to your organization. When I first started working in IT, quite a few years ago, we had paper backups. You know, if the computers all went off, no big deal, we'll just switch to paper forms and we'll key it all back in tomorrow. That's not really the case anymore. You've only got to look at things like the visa outage that happened a few weeks ago. TSB. Is TSB even fixed yet? I don't think it is, is it? But if you look at how that's reported, that's reported as an IT failure. And if you're a TSB customer, that's not an IT failure you're experiencing. That's a banking failure, and it's a business failure. So digital transformation is about how important technology is. It's about how embedded it is in every single thing that we do. And that's why we need to spend some time thinking about it. And any organization that has looked at it and gone, meh, not for us. Well, you know, Kodak, Blockbuster, all of these companies, they're all cited as uh, fairly good examples of people who ignored the, uh, the winds of change. So it is worth spending a little bit of time looking at what this means for your organization. I'm not from the education sector, but talking to colleagues I have that work at universities, you can see how much has changed in your world as well. 
online courses, MOOCs, much higher expectations from students about the support and the services that you're going to offer, the flexibility that they demand. You know, this, this touches every, every sector. It's public sector, it's private sector. So this is about evolution of organisations. This isn't a project that you could kick off today and you'll be finished in six weeks. You know, ta-da, we digitally transformed, what's next? This is about an ongoing way of thinking. And in a way, digital transformation is, is not the best expression because it does imply that there is a beginning and an end. But in fact, this is a shift in thinking. It's a shift in thinking for every single thing that we do, every product, every service. It's all about how we look at technology enabling what we do as an organization. And one of the responses, I guess, that has happened as a result of this is ways of working have changed. So I did my ITIL V2 managers maybe 10, 11 years ago. And at the time, there was ITIL and there was PRINCE2. And that was pretty much it. And if you wanted to be an ITIL trainer, you could charge an awful lot of money for that. And if you wanted to be an ITIL consultant, you could charge even more. And that was all you really had to do for the rest of your career. But then in the last five years, it's been kind of amazing to see Agile, DevOps, Lean IT, Ubea, Kanban, Kaizen, all of these new ways of working coming in. And, and just again, because I'm, I'm not as familiar with your sector, you know, I guess we'll start with the basics, you know. Put your hand up if you do some ITIL. Okay, most of the room, nice to see. DevOps. About a third. Agile. Lean. Kanban. Kaizen. Nice. Ubeya. We get gradually more and more niche here until the responses just die away. But what this is a sign of is organizations trying to work differently. So ITIL brought us some amazing standardization. It brought in processes. It brought in concepts like having customers and service levels. But then the demands changed. And suddenly we had to do things more quickly. Or we had to do things involving more teams. Or we had to do things in smaller iterations. So all of these new ways of working are developing within organizations. and. It's amazing. You know, for me, this is one of the most interesting times to be in technology because of how fast things are changing. But it can also feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, I, I run an e-learning business and we, we sell service management training. And we get emails from people saying, what am I supposed to study? You know, 10 years ago, and I, I would have just said, well, I saw foundation and then take it from there. Now, well, where are you working? Do you need DevOps Foundation? Do you need to be studying SIAM? Do you need Lean IT? Things have become a lot more complicated. And what that means is pressure on us as individuals, as support, service professionals, IT professionals. What do we even call ourselves anymore? And one of the really I guess eye-opening conversations that we had when I was working with the author group, we were working on the Verizon project, was we kept talking about IT. And then somebody said, when you say IT, what do you mean? Do you mean the department, the people, or do you mean the technology? Because IT now is happening outside the IT department. So the business, as we kind of think of them, our customers, our consumers, they're doing IT. And as IT people, we have to understand our customers and the organizations that we work within. So we're not purely technical anymore. We have to start to think in a way that is very aligned with the organization that we work within. So the challenge is on us as professionals too. And you can see this in a lot of the conversations now that are happening around lifelong learning, education's changing, it's not about taking one course a year anymore, it's about continual development, 
there's pressures on us as well. So organisations are feeling the strain, individuals are feeling the strain, and it, it really needs kind of a new way of thinking about IT within organisations. So a year ago, I was approached by a new organisation, the International Foundation for Digital Competencies, which is the IFDC, and I'm very grateful to them for shortening that because it is such a mouthful. Um, but they're a, they're a non-profit organisation set up by a number of bodies. You know, you might have heard of BCS, hopefully, Exane, APMG, Van Haren. They kind of created this foundation to say, let's have a think about how we might need to develop, how we might need to evolve within service management. And they came to me a year ago and said, Claire, would you like to lead this project? And that was one of those, I think, <laughs> sliding doors moments. It could have gone either way. But for me, this was such an amazing opportunity to fix everything that I've been moaning about for the last goodness knows how many years. So I said yes, and this is the project that I've been working on in that 12 months since then. So the first thing we did was we said, this absolutely cannot be two or three people locking themselves in a room and just saying, well, this is our view of the world. You know, this is, the, this is the Yorkshire view of how IT service management needs to change. Or this is the UK view. Or even this is the European view. We knew that we had to have a massive team of people. So we've worked on two publications. The first one was published in October last year. The author group there was about 50 people. And we've just completed the manuscript for the second publication where the author group was 70 people. So we have tried to be as democratic and as open as possible. And we looked for as much diversity as we could get. So age, gender, background, experience, sector, everything we could possibly do. Um, I did think I was doing quite well because, you know, we, we had quite a few people from the USA. So I thought, you know, that's North America covered. But the Canadian community was quite upset. We didn't have anyone from Canada, so we brought someone in from Canada. We never managed to get anyone from Russia, which ah, is a real regret. But, you know, we, we did our best. And, you know, for those of you that are kind of more active on social media, you might see some people there that you recognise. But equally, I would hope that you see lots of people that you don't recognise as well. Because we also made an effort to try and break out of the normal bubble so, you know, the, the, the consultants that you see speaking at every conference, hugely experienced, but we wanted the people who were doing the job too. And within the author team, we had a lady called Sandra Whittleston, who some of you might know. She's done a huge amount to develop service management curriculums and higher education. And we also had a lady called Wendy, who's from Leeds City College, who's working with 17, 18 year olds. And one of the things that we're going to try and do as we move forward with Verism is look at how we get this thinking actually into syllabus documents, onto curriculums for people at school, for people at university, because we are a service economy. But the feedback that comes from industry is that the people who come out of our schools and out of our universities are not necessarily ready to work in business. Um, I did go chat to one of the lecturers at York University and I was kind of talking about the people who are doing the computer science degrees. Is this the sort of thing they might be interested? And the message I got back, which I thought was fascinating, is people who do computer science don't want to work in IT. They're going to go work in the city. And I thought, oh, okay, um, interesting. But we, we, we tried to make this as, as global, as diverse as we could. And one of the things that we very much want to do is actually drive this message now into schools and into universities. So you'll see some, uh, some of the contributing companies here as well. Again, some biggies you might recognize. Microsoft, NHS Digital. It was amazing to have their contribution because they are doing some absolutely innovative things. And again, 
we've got good global coverage there. So Kinetic IT from Australia, Happy Signals, Finland, Blue Hat, Denmark, Huawei, I always really struggle with, but China. <laughs> I've got a, a Huawei phone, but I might get an HTC next time, I think. <laughs> And what we came up with is Verism, and we called it a service management approach for the digital age. For those of you that, that kind of work on projects similar to this, or even have to name an initiative in your organization, you will know how painful these things can be. The first question we had to debate at great length was, is this actually something that is necessary? You know, given that we've got ITIL, DevOps, Lean, Kanban, Agile, all the rest of them, is the world ready for something else? What are we going to call it? But um, Gareth introduced it with that word approach, which is just perfect. Because what we tried to say was, do you know what? The world doesn't need another framework. It doesn't need another standard. It doesn't need another, you know, follow this process and all your dreams will come true what the world needs now is a map, is a way of managing complexity, and is a way of thinking strategically about IT. And that was the approach we took with Verism. This is something to use across your organization. It's something to break the boundaries of IT. And it's, some, it's a way of starting to have those conversations about how do we all work together. You know, Dev, DevOps was trying to unify Dev and Ops. Agile tries to bring in much more representation from the consumer, but we are still so tribal within organizations. We've got business and IT. Within IT, we've got dev and ops. Within dev, we've got the different technologies that people use. It's trying to get away from this fragmentation. So the intention behind Verism is to give you a way to think about everything that's happening within your organization and actually start to knit things together. So a lot of the feedback we had was from organizations that have adopted, say, a new technology, but it's restricted to one area of the organization. Or they had one part of the organization that was working in a really innovative way, but then they were hitting a roadblock with another part of the organization. You know, it happens very often where you've got an agile development team that bumps up against a very traditional bureaucratic change management process. There's frustration on both sides, but there's also value on both sides, and it's finding a way to kind of bridge that chasm. And one of the questions we get asked quite frequently is, so is this the next thing that I have to do? You know, I, I did my ITIL training, or I did my COBIT training, are we just forgetting about all of that now, and it's, it's verism is the way forward? And the answer to that is absolutely not. What we understand now is that for most organizations, you've got pockets of all of this. You have got bits of ITIL, bits of DevOps, bits of Agile. You've got silos. What's missing is that cross-organizational perspective, is that holistic view. And <laughs> sadly, this is what you get, tribalism, you know. If you go to a DevOps conference, quite often they're not that polite about ITIL. If you go to an ITIL conference, they see Agile as being a bit Wild West. Other areas of the organization, they've all got their ways of working as well. You know, we've got processes in HR that manage things like induction. We've got financial processes. All of these things end up clashing and bumping against each other. Even if we're really, really innovative within the IT department, you know, we're agile, we're lean, guess what, you've got a five-year funding cycle. So the idea of not having a five-year project plan just doesn't work for the organization. So it's not just within IT that we need to innovate, it's outside IT. We need to look at the business processes as well to try and fix some of these um, head clashes that we have within organizations. So some very some key concepts. The first thing we wanted to do is explode this idea that the IT department pretends it's a business and the rest of the organization is its customer. Because 
the IT department isn't all of the IT that's happening in an organisation. In fact, every organisation has strategic goals that it works towards and it needs to use all of its capabilities to move towards those goals. So if you want your students to be happy, that involves your estates, it involves your lecturers, it involves the technology that allows students to access information when they're back in halls on a night. All of these things have to pull together. So the IT department can't sit on its own anymore. It causes frustration on both sides. You know, the business gets frustrated because IT becomes the gatekeeper of the exciting things that they want. But it's difficult for the IT department as well because we get kicked when things go wrong. So the first thing with Verism is think about the whole organisation as the service provider. Understand who your consumers are. Understand your strategic goals, what you're trying to do as an organisation. But then think about everything that you have to glue together in order for that to happen. And even that has been challenging for some of the author group that I've worked with to get away from this idea that IT lives within one team. But the, the, um, the publication that we've just been working on has got a really interesting case study in, which is from a software startup. And they've decided strategically that they do not have and never will have an IT department. All the different business areas are free to procure what they want. There is a financial team, and the financial team will manage payments, and they will make sure that these suppliers are delivering what they said they would do. And there is also a CTO, and the CTO's role is to make sure that whatever everybody's buying integrates, doesn't cause any security issues, works with everything else. But that's the limit of the IT department that they have, and actually that they ever intend to have as well. So we need to start thinking organisation-wide. We all need to start working together and learning from each other. There are good things happening in other areas of the organisation, and there are things that we can share as well. You know, lean. We didn't invent that in IT. We pinched that from manufacturing. And equally, enterprise service management is departments like HR and finance pinching the things that we do really, really well in IT. So if we can broaden our minds a little bit, we can see benefits right across the organisation. And we made a model. We, we tried to keep this as high level as possible because we don't want to be prescriptive. You know, Verism sits above all of these frameworks and then however you choose to work as an organisation, that gives you the prescriptive piece. If you're agile or if you waterfall, that dictates how you do things. But everything starts and ends with the consumer. And this was another one of these big terminology debates, you know, customer, user, consumer, what do we call them? And we went with consumer because actually now, when you think about what we class as a product or a service, people aren't always giving you money for things. People might interact with your brand on social media without ever ha actually having purchased something from you. We all use free services every day. You know, you'll all have apps on your phone which are provided free of charge. You are consuming them. You have a relationship with that service provider, but it's not a financial one. So the consumer is dictating what we do, but we also have you know, the governance and the strategy that every organization has that says, what are we trying to achieve? What do we have to do? How much can we spend to do it? What legislation applies to us? These are the things that we have to think about. None of that is new. But we said your governance and your strategy then, use that to define service management principles. Because if you can provide high level principles across your organization, what you can then do is say to your product teams and your service teams, work however you want. Do DevOps, do Agile, do whatever works best for you, as long as you stay within these principles. So they will cover things like security, quality. You know, are you an organization that values perfection? 
or is speed to market the thing that's absolutely crucial for you and actually your consumers don't care if there's a few bumps in the service that you put out. Get these principles right and then you can free up your teams to work in different ways but they still have that guidance because you do hear horror stories about organisations where the Agile team has built something wonderful but it doesn't scale or it doesn't integrate with something else in the organisation. So set the principles and then when we start to think about you know, this life cycle for a product or a service, work out what it's going to be, produce it, provide it, and then interact with your consumers, your teams can work in the way that best suits them. And as new ways of working develop, you know, five years ago, DevOps wasn't a thing. There might be a new DevOps tomorrow. You can integrate that into your organization. It's not a case of throwing away everything you've done. It's a case of looking at new things that evolve and saying, is this right for us? If it is, how are we going to integrate that? And it's the management mesh, which is the thing that's unique to Verism and which is the thing that provides that flexibility. So governance defines principles. That will feed into the portfolio that your organization has, the products and services that you invest in. And this just gives you an example of how those principles will grow. So for example, you might have a high level principle that we're a really customer centric organization. And apologies at the back if you can't read this. I'm assuming the slide's gonna be available. Yep, so you'll get these diagrams afterwards. You might have a, a, a principle that you are customer centric. That's what you value as an organization. So already you're sending a message that maybe we're willing to spend a little bit more to get customer satisfaction. Maybe we're gonna be slightly more flexible in the packages that we offer. But that means that then, at an organizational level, you can define the level of customer satisfaction you want to provide. And then within the individual practice areas, you can have your teams focus on meeting customer needs because they've got very clear guidance that that is what you value as an organization. And that will cascade, cascade down through the organization so that everybody who is making a decision, even the people who are you know, on the very, very front line answering the phone to customers when something goes wrong, they understand. You know, the help desk that we have within my organization, we've outsourced our help desk, but we've given all of the team a $50 limit. So if there's something that's going wrong and they can fix it and it costs less than $50, they can do it. And all we ask is that they tell us about it afterwards. You know, what did we do? Could we do it better next time? But they understand that. They understand how much we value our customers. $50 worth, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> we would spend more, but it would need to be escalated. Um, so, the management mesh is the thing that is unique to Verism. And what the management mesh is, is an integrated way of looking at your organization. So this is meant to be a tool to help you think about everything that's going on. So you've got a resources side, and that's where you'd have people, suppliers, time, budget. You know, every organization might have something slightly different to put there, but that's the kind of thing that you need to think about. Environment, what legislation applies to you? Have you got competition? What are they doing? that needs thinking about as well. And to a certain extent, we do that already. But then it's the other sides of the mesh where we start to think, okay, management practices. If you are doing DevOps, ITIL, Lean, Agile, Kanban, and all the rest of it in your organization, is that all working together? Or is it bumping into each other? Have we got some practices and ways of working that actually we could retire? Is there something new that we should be doing? And it's the same with emerging technologies. And we kind of specifically called out emerging technologies. So this isn't kind of your data center or you know, the printers. This is thinking about things like big data and artificial intelligence. Because it's all really, really trendy and cool, but most people aren't actually doing it. However, as our products and services evolve, we should be thinking about doing it. So again, coming back to my help desk, 
we're looking at the moment about, you know, can we build in a chatbot? We've got a technical issue that is recurring. People usually report it using one word. Can we give them an automated response that will be faster for them and hopefully will fix things a bit more quickly? So thinking about emerging technologies, but thinking about them logically, not a kind of a, ooh, shiny thing sort of way, thinking about what does this mean for our products and services. So what we need to do, oh, there we go. I thought I was in the wrong place. What we need to do, first of all, is map our current organizational mesh. So what have we got in terms of resources, technologies, practices, environment? And again, you know, we've, we've used colors here. So for example, down from time, you've got a long green line. So in fact, time pressure wise, we're, we're not doing too bad. We've got um, culture. We've got a pretty long line that's coming there. But in the service stabilized areas where you've got things like metrics and internal tools, the line's shorter. So we've got kind of limited capabilities in that area. But if you are then developing a new product or service, what you can start to do is think, well, what do I need for that? And have I actually got any gaps? Is there anything missing in the organization? Do I need to be integrating a new technology? Do we need to work on this in a different way? So for example, you've got a big red line there under knowledge. So we need to kind of either procure or develop some knowledge in this area. Legislation, we've got a line against it. There's something that impacts us there. So we can start to think about gaps. What do we need to make this new product and service work? Because ultimately, we have to source and fill those gaps and integrate that into our mesh and look at anything that becomes redundant as a result of that. So every organization can build its own management mesh and can evolve it continually. And what this does is it gives you a really simple visual way of working out what you've got where you've got gaps and this is the kind of thing that is perfect as well to have conversations with non-technical people or people outside the particular project that you're working on it's a really simple visual way of saying look this is what we need or this isn't going to happen so each organization builds and evolves and updates its own mesh and we are talking to a couple of um, software providers at the moment. So there's one software provider, Solitis. Um, they've already got something that is pretty similar to this. So they're looking at way of automating, building these. Um, and we're chatting to some of the bigger players as well, like ServiceNow. They've been part of the Verizon project and they're looking at building a way to actually link this um, to their next release. So in terms of that's all very nice, but who's actually doing it? Because Verizon is pretty much brand new. Um, we've just finished the second book, and we've got some early adopter case studies in there. So Kabu.com is a fintech company from Japan, and they're using Verizon as part of a project to develop a um, Bitcoin solution. So there's a case study from them in the book. Citic Tech are an enormous Chinese company and they're using it because they have, Citic Group is enormous, Citic Tech is a small part of that, and they're using Verizon to help them build things that support the other parts of this group. And then we've got 6.6 .6 Cloud Gateway, who are a cloud services startup based down in London, and they're using Verizon to help them build their entire support model and build the way that they work with their customers so they've done us a really nice case study as well and if any of you are going to the ITSMF UK conference later on this year Steve from Cloud Gateway is there talking about his story with Verism and just sharing a bit more information we do have another very big financial services company who would just they couldn't get approval for their case study before the deadline for the book unfortunately but they are um, intending to kind of carry on working on a white paper, so there'll be more publications coming from IFDC. And kind of the last thing is what happens next. 
So the first Verizon book has been published. The second one is due in October this year, and that's a more in-depth kind of practitioner's guide. So if you want to do Verizon in your organization, that's the book that gives you the examples and the stories that you need in order to help you do that. There's been training developed that runs alongside it, and we've been speaking at a lot of conferences, getting feedback, having that conversation with people, and just really trying to get as many perspectives as possible. And the next steps for the IFD, IFDC are to continue building the community. So having a community of practice for consultants, for software providers, we've got an education group which is going, and just trying to now carry this on as a community project and, and move it forward. And I would say, um, just before we go to questions, we have developed this as a global conversation and we want to continue to do so. So these are my contact details, use them. Um, you know, find me on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, share your feedback and input as well. I don't, um, I'm not hiding my phone number, but after I got a WhatsApp from Pakistan at four o'clock in the morning, which was from a slide share, um, I don't put it up on slides anymore, but you know, this is a conversation. Talk to me, talk to any of the author group. We want to kind of continue to drive this forward. And I am still the only Claire Agatha in the world. So don't worry that you're gonna be bothering somebody else. And I think we've got a couple of minutes still for questions. Okay. Any any questions, please? It's the naughty table again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. I just wanted to say I think it's brilliant that diversity was such a driving force behind it because I think sometimes in IT we have a tendency to have the same people looking at things and whether that be people that are very technically based making a system for people that aren't and they're thinking about the technical side and not necessarily the user side of it. So it's really good that you've thought about diversity in that and getting lots of people working on it. Thank you, appreciate that. It, it was, um, it's something I'm actually thinking about, uh, maybe blogging about, because before I did the Verizon project, I did something quite similar for Siam, which is service integration and management, and again, working with an author group there. And there's an awful lot that I've learned along the way about working with, with volunteers. You know, these are all people who are giving their time freely working with volunteers, working with these big groups. You can imagine working with 70 people. It, it, it just it can be overwhelming. So we had a Slack channel that was running. We had weekly conference calls, but we had one that was early so the New Zealand, Australia people could join and one that was late so that the USA people could join. We avoided email as much as possible. But even then, you know, the, the collaboration element was quite difficult when you have 70 people working on essentially what is one document and you know the number of conflicted copies in the drop box and all the rest of it did, did get a bit infuriating but I, I do genuinely believe that the more people who were involved the better and there were people joining the group even in the last weeks doing final reviews so thank you. Any more questions please? No? Okay. Well, everyone, if you thank me for joining me again and thanking Claire. Thank you very much.